This is going to be verse by verse of Genesis chapter 11. And we're going to talk about the real Tower of Terror. Now imagine you are back then in Genesis chapter 11, back in the days of Nimrod. And you can walk right up to the Tower of Babel and go in it and maybe even see doors in it. Just imagine that there's doors in it and these doors lead to death, your destruction. And let's talk about some doors to death while we look at the Tower of Babel. Number one, a door of uniting without God. When they decided to make this Tower of Babel, they decided to unite without God. In Genesis 11.1, 1, it says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. The problem is that man was getting together without God. So the Lord had to put up some boundaries or they would never seek him. And when men put their heads together, they will get in over their heads. Imagine if everyone in the world got together right now and the so-called best minds put their smarts together. In Daniel 12, 4, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. One of the signs that we're getting closer and closer to the end is knowledge is increasing. Uh, the best minds are coming out with new inventions constantly. Man has a lot of knowledge and all he's mostly doing is making things that make it easier for him to fulfill his sinful desires. And today you hear things like unity. You hear about the United Nations. When the world was trying to force you to stay home because of the corona, one of their slogans was, we are alone together. That's stupid and crazy. Every time I heard that, it just made me want to smack them. Alone together? They pretend as if they're your friend. They are not your friend. And they say, we are all in this together. Even, even when man gets together, there are some men at the top who are only looking out for themselves. Quit saying stuff like alone together. Acting like you just love other people and the, the, all the people out there. Uh, men uniting together outside of God is a door to death. One man and God is more powerful than all the rest of the men gathered together. One man and God is the majority. Uh, Genesis 11, 2, And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Notice it says, they journeyed. When you start your journey, you need to make sure that it doesn't cross God's word. Like Paul said in Romans 1, 10, Making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So as they journey from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. When men get together without God, they get so engobbed in what they discovered. They get so infatuated with what they found. It's all about them. They want to be on the discovery channel. Has it ever occurred to you that God doesn't have to discover anything? He already knows it's there. But these guys, they, they journeyed from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar. And even though these people with one language and one speech, even though they had Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth as parents and grandparents, they still make this stupid decision of getting together without God. Even though they knew the story of eight people getting on an ark and the majority was wrong and eight people and God were right. Did you know that Noah lived 350 years after the flood? He would have seen the construction of the tower. Nimrod was one of his grandsons. He might have bounced Nimrod on his knee as a kid. They could have consulted with Noah, but I'm sure they would have forsook wise counsel. I mean, they united without God. Eight people survived the flood and billions of people perished. History showed them that one man with God is more right than billions without God. They say alone together today. Well, they're alone even when they are together. They're without hope and without God in the world. Genesis eleven three, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them through thee. And they, met, they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. They said, Let us make brick. They had the wrong foundation, and they were building with just themselves. Stone is better than brick. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He's our foundation. For no foundation, 
For no other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, Jesus Christ. Brick is man-made. Brick is hardened clay. That is what they were themselves. They were hardened clay. They're, they were hard-hearted. Job 33, 6 says, Behold, I am according to thy wish, and God said, I also am formed out of the clay. Romans 2, 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. They were hardened clay, treasuring up wrath. They use man-made stuff like brick and slime. This city is man-made. Uh, Genesis eleven four, and they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name. See how conceited. See how they want to be like the devil. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. It says, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They got together and began to build. These weren't lazy people. These were evil workers. Sometimes the devil's crowd works much harder than the Lord's crowd. Think about it. The devil wants hard workers. And men who sit around doing nothing don't really help God or the devil. The God, does, God doesn't use them. The devil doesn't use them. The devil wants hard workers, just like God uses hard workers. And they're going to build a city and a tower. And if you're a Bible believer, then you know that man-made cities are temporal, and we are looking for something eternal. Nimrod was looking at this temporal place. But Hebrews 11.10 says, talking about Abraham, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God, not Nimrod and the people in Babel. They are going to build this tower, whose top reaches up to heaven. Now, which heaven? Uh, there's more than one. You have the third heaven where God is, where Paul went and came back in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2. And this is the heaven most people are referring to when they say, are you going to heaven when you die? But then you have the second heaven in Genesis 1, 14, where it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So this is the second heaven. This is where you have the moon and the stars and the sun. Then you have the first heaven in Genesis 1.20, where it says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So it seems the third heaven, obviously that's where God's throne is. The second heaven is gen generally where the sun, moon, and stars are, and the first heaven is our atmosphere. So I think it's a possibility that they were trying to reach the clouds. Maybe there is an entry door that can bring a person from the third heaven to the earth, but the door has to be opened from the other side. You see where Elijah was taken up by a whirlwind into heaven, and when Elijah and Moses appear on the mount, a bright cloud overshadows them. When Jesus Christ comes in Revelation 1, behold, he cometh with clouds. Look up that word clouds. And also look at the next verse, Genesis eleven five. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Maybe the Lord used their tower for kicks. Of course, as the angel of the Lord, he could teleport back and forth. But just for kicks, you know, maybe he, you know, went through that, that door and walked down the Tower of Babel just for kicks. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower. And the men of Babylon were most likely trying to make contact with the sons of God as they did in Genesis 6. Just like men today are trying to make contact with spirits and aliens and even build a machine worth billions of dollars to do so. Look up the Large Hadron Collider or whatever it is. Men are very interested in the spiritual realm and making contact. Maybe these people in the Tower of Babel were trying to reach a door to the other side so that they could make contact with those sons of God just like they did in Genesis 6. They wanted, most likely, I'm just speculating here, so don't jump down my throat. I'm just speculating. Maybe they wanted that advanced civil civilization like there possibly was before the flood. Shem, Ham, and Japheth were still around to tell them stories of the previous time before the flood. And the men of Babylon wanted a piece of heaven to come down or to reach a piece of heaven without having anything to do with God. They wanted the sons of God to come to them, possibly. 
But this is foolish because as Bible believers, we know that heaven comes down to us. Why build a tower to reach heaven or to reach something heavenly when the heaven comes down to us in Revelation 21, 2, when I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Men today are trying to make their own kingdom and make their own eternal bodies through science and technology. It's much easier just to get saved and get a new body at the rapture. Why worry about getting a new robotic body that will live forever when you can just get a new body that will never sin? But men want eternity in their sins. The more they get together, the smarter they will become, and the Lord will only let them go so far. Genesis eleven six, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So the Lord saw the tower as such a danger that he had to put a stop to it. And like I said, I believe they were trying to make contact with the sons of God to, to get higher knowledge, higher intelligence about building something big so that they could really make themselves a name. And that's speculation. Maybe you got your own speculation, and that's cool too. So the Lord saw the tower as a danger. He had to put a stop to it. So this just wasn't some tower that people were ignorantly making that they were trying to reach the third heaven with. I don't think they were trying to reach the third heaven with the, with the tower because obviously they, can't, they couldn't do that. As mortal people, we can't build a tower that's going to reach the third heaven. So that's not likely because the Lord saw this tower as a danger. If they were trying to reach the third heaven with it, you know, the Lord's just going to laugh at them. He's not going to come down and, and say nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. So they were on to something. Maybe in the cloud, there is a door. And if you can get somebody to open it from the other side, then they, can, they will come down. And that, that's probably what they were trying to do with the Tower of Babel possibly enticed the sons of God like they were enticed in Genesis 6 when they saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all which they chose. Maybe they were using the women to entice them once again. And they always say, well, he said nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. What's something they always say today? Use your imagination. Just like they were doing in Genesis 6. In Genesis 6, 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In the tower, men were entering the door of unity without God. Practically speaking here, I'm not saying there was a door that had this label on it before you attack me. The, uh, I'm just trying to get, get some, give you some practical application. If you go through that door of, I'm just going to, join up with all these people over here, whether it be for fame, fortune, popularity, or to make yourself a name, and join up with this unity together with another Jesus or without God, this, that's a door to death. It's a door to destruction. Number two, they enter the door of self-glory. In Genesis eleven four, it says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They aren't at all concerned with the name above every name. They are desirous of vain glory. And any time you set out to accomplish anything, you need to make sure it is for God and that he will get the glory. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, there, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whose glory? Who would have got glory out of what they were doing? Nimrod and his henchmen. They weren't trying to get God any glory. On your road to making yourself a name, you will end up running over people and doing deceitful things in the process. And on your road to making yourself a name, Proverbs 10, 7 says, The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Who would want to be named Nimrod today? When I was a kid, everyone would call you stupid by saying, You're such a Nimrod. I mean, who would want to be called Babel Baptist Church? I mean, their name rotted. Nobody wants to be named Nimrod. Nobody wants to be named Jezebel. Nobody wants to be named Judas. 
But next, when they went in the tower, they chose the door of rebellion. Genesis 11, 4, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. I believe it was the Amazon owner guy, the Bezos guy, talking about how he thinks we should make a cities outside of the earth. He wants to build a city. And, you know, uh, Elon Musk got involved in the space stuff t- as well. You see, these guys got all this money, and they want to keep that money. They want to live forever in their sin, and they're trying any way they can to think of a way to escape the wrath that's to come, because deep down they know it's coming. But, you see, God wanted these people scattered. In rebellion, they chose not to. He knew the dangers of them getting together. He knew that men feel powerful with numbers, and when you feel powerful, you're actually more weak. That's why Paul says, For when I am weak, then am I strong, in 2 Corinthians 12.10. But they were led by Nimrod, who was the 13th from Adam, and his name means rebel. Why do men want to reach outer space so bad today? They are rebels. They want to have a place to go to when God lets his wrath loose on this planet, because deep down they know what is coming. But you can't hide from God. He's going to burn up everything and not just the earth. And you can't hide from God. In Amos 9, 2 through 3, it says, Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. You can't hide in the bottom of the sea. You can't climb up to heaven and hide. You can't dig into hell and hide. If you make your bed in hell, he's there. Man wants to stay in his rebellion and have ways to get out of the consequences. There are always consequences. And the Lord had to come down and confound their language. He says in Genesis 11, 7, Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. If they can't understand each other's speech, then that means this puts a kink in their plan. Now they're going to have to spread out. Notice the Lord said, let us come down. In the past few verses, you saw the people saying, let us do this and do that. Now it is the Lord's turn. He says, let us come down. Now who is this us? When the Lord said, let us come down, well, God is one in three and three in one. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Genesis 11, 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off to build the city. So this is as easy for the Lord to do this as me and you stepping on an anthill. Even easier. Like God's like not impressed at all. And so they are divided by their families and tongues, as we talked about last week. Remember how I said it seems to be how the people were divided after the... Genesis 10 seems to be how the people were divided after the events of the flood and the Tower of Babel. Because in Genesis 10.32, it says, These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So God came down and confounded their language in Genesis eleven nine. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, or Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Rebellion has consequences. Your rebellion has consequences. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Babel means confusion. It also means gate of the gods. Look that up. This is another reason why it seems they were trying to make contact and get higher intelligence, just like they are trying to do today. Now, the rest of the chapter is about the line of Shem, and his line is significant because Jesus Christ manifested in the flesh through this line. He came from from this line when he manifested himself in the flesh. Abraham, Moses, and David come through this line, and from this line come the children of Israel, which is what the rest of Genesis will be about. The rest of Genesis will be about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who is Israel, and his children, and the promised seed comes through Shem. So there is the focus, the promised seed. And to many people, this genealogy is boring, but man, it really sheds some light on some stuff. In Genesis 11:10 it says these are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat our facts said 2 years after the flood. So why do you think well wow, that seems like a boring verse but 
Look at this. Shem was an hundred years old and beget our facts had two years after the flood. So Shem saw the best of both worlds. Think about it. He was here before the flood and saw all that most likely an advanced civilization, probably more advanced than we have now. And he lived in what the movies make out to be a fairy tale land. He saw the giants. He saw the long lifespans. He saw the stuff that went with the pre-flood days. But then he also saw life after the flood. He saw the Tower of Babel. He knew who Nimrod was. In Genesis eleven eleven, and Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad said five hundred years and begat sons and daughters. That's amazing. So Shem lived a hundred years before the flood. And another 502 years after the flood. You know what this means? This means that Shem's life crossed over with that of Abraham. And this is why many people believe Shem is Melchizedek. Can you imagine how many people wanted to go and get wisdom from Shem during that 500 years? to be like, man, this guy's a legend. He was here before the flood. He was on the ark. Uh, they'd all be going to talk to him. Something else we're going to see with this genealogy is the fact that the lifespan of men started to decrease. Their grandfather Noah lived to be over 900, but look what happens to them in Genesis 11:12 through 13. And our facts had lived five and thirty years and begat Selah. And our facts had lived after he begat Selah 403 years and begat sons and daughters. So our facts had died at 438 years old, much younger than Noah and Shem. Genesis eleven fourteen and 15, And Selah lived 30 years and begat Eber. And Selah lived after he begat Eber 403 years and begat sons and daughters. Selah lived to be 433 years old. Genesis eleven sixteen through 17, And Eber lived, 40, or lived 4 and 30 years and begat Peleg. And Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. Eber lived to be 464 years old, much younger than Noah and Shem. Genesis eleven eighteen and 19, And Peleg lived 30 years and beget Reu. And Peleg lived after he beget Reu 209 years and beget sons and daughters. So Peleg lived to be 200, only 239 years. That seems like a lot, but not compared to 900. Genesis eleven twenty through 21, And Reu lived 2 and 30 years and beget Serug. And Reu lived after he beget Serug 207 years and beget sons and daughters. So he lived, Reu lived to be 239 years old as well. 22 and 23, And Serug lived 30 years and beget Nahor. And Serug lived after he beget Nahor 200 years and beget sons and daughters. So Serug lived to be 230 years old. Genesis eleven twenty four through 25, And Nahor lived nine and twenty years, and beget Terah. And Nahor lived after he beget Terah, and hundred and nineteen years, and beget sons and daughters. So Nahor lived to be a hundred, only a hundred and forty-eight years old. You got people getting close to that today, living to be like a hundred and eleven. There's probably hundred and twenty-year-olds somewhere. Genesis eleven twenty six, And Terah lived seventy years, and beget Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, here is our new main character, Abram. His name is later changed to Abraham. And if you go back through the genealogy, you will, you will find that Abraham was born 292 years after the flood. Now, this gives us a very interesting fact. We know that Abraham's life crossed over with Shem's life. But another cool fact is that Noah was alive on the earth while Abraham was alive on the earth. So, Abraham came 292 years after the flood, right? Go back and, and count all that up, and you'll see he lived 292 years after the... He was born 292 years after the flood. Now look at Genesis 9.28. It says, And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So if Noah was alive on the earth 350 years after the flood, and Abram was born 292 years after the flood, they were alive after the same, at the same time. And if you have been reading the Bible for a while and you are familiar with the stories of Noah and Abraham, then this is a really fascinating fact, most likely for you. I mean, it blew my mind. I never re really even thought about it or realized it up until a few years ago that Abraham and Noah would have been on the earth at the same time. That just blew my mind. And Genesis 11, and if without these genealogies, you wouldn't know this stuff. That's why it's, there's just so much in it. It's not just names. 
All right, verse 27 and 28. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. So Ur is an important city of Babylonia. So Abraham would have seen the downfall of the Tower of Babel, most likely. It says in Genesis eleven twenty nine and 30, And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. And Sarai was barren. She had no child. So Sarah, along with six other women in the Bible, picture the miracle virgin birth of Mary. And something about Sarai is she is Abraham's half-sister. But she's his wife. And this is not wrong because it, God doesn't say that this is wrong until the book of Leviticus under the law. So Genesis eleven thirty one and 32. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came into Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. So Terah lived to be only 205, and Abraham lived to be even less. So this genealogy is not just a bunch of names. It showed you all kinds of crazy facts. But what you saw in Genesis 11 was the Tower of Babel, the real Tower of Terror. And the doors in it only lead to death. If you are building your own Tower of Babel today, and you go through that door of unity without God, that door of self-glorification, and that door of rebellion, then those are doors to death. You need to quit trying to build a tower of Babel and build upon the foundation with gold, precious stones, instead of using wood, hay, and stubble. If you're a Christian, the moment you got born again, you started building something, and you need to be building with the motive of giving glory to the Lord Jesus Christ.